We're back at Calix Cafe. I'm joined by Tom Miller, who is a clinical research associate. And we're going to talk about how you make the sites and the sponsors' objectives meet. And I've got a surprise for you, so let's go! Hello and welcome to Kelix Cafe and yes, I have a surprise for you as I'm not on my own in the cafe. I'm joined by Tom Miller and I'm very pleased uh, to having someone uh, who I can share a piece of brownie with. Hi Tom, welcome. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you, Sylvania. Thank you for having me. It's been a busy morning, but it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, well, thank you for joining us. It's very nice. Uh, so, um, why don't you tell us how you got into the, the clinical industry? Well, so it was going back to about 2004 and I was fresh out of university and kind of fell into a job at one of the previous incarnations of Calix, which was um, uh, ClinFoam. And I, it was my first um, job out of university and it was working in the support team. And through working in that role, I became familiar with the trials process and the role of the, uh, the monitor, the CRA. And I managed to uh, get an interview and a placement with um, uh, Quintiles, or back in the day was Quintiles, and did a, a CRA school for eight weeks and uh, graduated as a, as a CRA. Um, I spent the first probably seven or eight years of my career um, working my way through various uh, pharma and, and, and CROs. Um, sort of learning my trade and then about six or seven years ago I made the decision to go uh, freelance and become a contractor um, which uh, had various benefits including uh, being able to work for a wider variety of clients often quite smaller clients as well so small biotech, small pharma um, and enabled me to kind of really hone my craft and, and learn more in, in other areas of research that perhaps I hadn't been exposed to before. Uh, such as study setup and submissions and, and uh, areas of project management. So that was kind of the, the career progression pathway, um, which has, has led me to where I am uh, now. Nice. And interesting to hear that um, you're exposed to, to more than the, like the site monitoring aspect. Because uh, I'm sure a lot of, of us think uh, uh, of the CRA role as monitoring, uh, but it sounds like there's, there's more to it. Um, and so, is there anything you like in particular, uh, like any type of trials that really excite you? I mean, for the last uh, sort of five to six years, uh, I've been mainly working in, in medical device, um, which for me is um, kind of an area of passion. I guess it's my inner, my inner geek coming out and that I, I, I love learning about the technology in, in, in modern devices and, and how that, that, that area of, of research is progressing. Um, so that was a really big draw for me. Um, and then, I mean, one of my um, you know, favorite parts of the role, I suppose, is, is the, the human interaction part. You know, it's, it's being that, that connection between the sponsor or the CRO and, and the site and being able to help the sites and facilitate them with the research whilst also meeting the objectives and the aims of the sponsor. Um, which at times can always feel like you're playing a puzzle or a game and it, it, it's finding the best way, the best solution to have those puzzle pieces mix and match, which they don't always perfectly align. Um, so that's another area that I, I the challenge of that, I, I really enjoy doing actually. Okay, could you tell us a bit more about that? Because uh, I've never really thought about it this way, but it's true that the objectives of the sponsor and the site may not necessarily always meet. No, that's that's very often correct. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, with the the, the, the client or the sponsor, um, they are essentially a business, and they have um, a sort of budgetary constraints, and they have um, you know uh, shareholders to appease, and they have you know the, the, these these devices or these pharma um, uh, new drugs need to be brought to market, and obviously, from the time of um, conception or, or developing a particular product, there is a limited lifespan in terms of the patents before it expires. And so there's a limited amount of time they can actually commercialize that product. So every delay to the running of a study, uh, be it days or weeks or months, can, can really impact the, the sponsor um, in a number of ways. And, and not just financially as well. A lot of the time they will have a study end date 
um, very well planned to coordinate with, for example, a large symposium or a global conference where they can present the data to a, um, an audience of, of um, you know, people in the industry who, who will help to bring that further into the market. Um, and I think the, the time pressures the sponsor has obviously conflict a lot with what the site staff have. So the site staff are 90% uh, of the time working within NHS organisations. They have their um, routine standard of care visits to do for, for non-study patients. And they also have their research to fit in amongst that as well. And I think sometimes the priorities of the sponsor are not always appreciated by the sites. The sites, are, both the site and the sponsor are always very focused on patient safety. Um, but obviously the sponsor also has that emphasis on patient data as well and, and good quality data. Um, so often when it comes to things such as data locks, where we're doing an interim analysis on a, on a particular study to see if the uh, results are looking promising, um, the sponsor will be very keen to have the data cleaned and entered by a certain time point. And it may be the site that coincides with a very busy period for that site in terms of maybe uh, staff off sick or perhaps there's a, an increased burden on that particular uh, hospital due to anything seasonal flu or just a, a higher caseload. Um, so I think that can be a, a situation where it's, it's managing the expectations of both sides and communicating to both sides as well, letting the sponsor know why it's a struggle and also letting the site know why it's so important to the sponsor. I think open communication is what really helps create understanding and, and um, cooperation. Really interesting. Um, much more to it than, than just uh, monitoring. So, yes, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, so actually, um, if you were to, if you had a sponsor here, uh, is there one thing that you'd like to tell them that would uh, make it easier to, to, to meet the site's objectives as well? I think there's this, one of the areas of difficulty that I've, I've come across in the last few years actually is the, um, particularly with the larger studies that are multinational. It's creating a, a protocol that often protocols are created to be used in a variety of countries. But obviously running a study in the UK versus running a study in the US versus, uh, versus running a study in Australia, they're very different healthcare systems. And I think sometimes, although for the sponsor it is easier to have a harmonised global protocol, I think sometimes that can create friction and, and issues at a site level um, if, if it doesn't fit in with their working practice. And this is particularly evident in the, in, in the UK with the NHS, you know, where it's already a very stretched and busy service and research is something that's having to be kind of injected and, 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 and uh, you know, fitted in between their commercial work. In, in the US it's quite often um, there's, there's more time available for research and, and the way it's structured means that it's um, easier to run studies in, in that kind of scenario. Um, so yeah, one, I think one option would be to, to look at tailoring protocols on a per country basis, whilst also making sure that they, you know, the, the, the data coming from each uh, country is comparable and can be used in the, in the final analysis. Um, and I think the other thing is, is appreciating the fact that the sites are so busy and, and are often working on, on many different studies and this is particularly the case when, when sponsors will often want to work with a key opinion leader. So they'd like to have a, for example, a cardiologist who's at the top of the field on, the, on that final research paper. Um, the problem with that is a key opinion leader is often going to be working on many, many, many studies. Um, they, they will be stretched from a time perspective and, and um, it, it sometimes, the, pro, the benefits don't always outweigh the uh, the cons from that sort of situation. So I think making it easier for the sites as well. So online training, streamlining training, rather than paper and pen and signatures, having you know uh, systems that can be logged into and alerts that are sent to, into an email inbox. And I think just harmonizing that process and, and appreciating that for a lot of these sites, um, if they're working on 10, 20 studies, that could translate to 10 or 20 different electronic systems as well. Various ECRF, CTMS, imaging upload portals, electronic site files. There's a, and I think it's not always appreciated that the, um, the sites, what a sponsor may feel is a, an efficient solution for a site may not actually be in reality um, a streamlined solution for a particular site. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. Um, and it, what I really like through everything you just mentioned is that there's always, or you always seem to go back to, to the human element and to like being conscious of 
who's at the other end uh, of, of the line talking about science here. So um, very, very uh, good to hear. Uh, and I'm sure uh, there will be people who will take this, uh, this feedback uh, that you just shared. Thank you. Um, right, I think that's all we've got time for today. Uh, just one last question from me. Um, what would you like to see in 10 years in the clinical trial space? I mean, I, there's probably two, two areas um, that I'm, I'm quite sort of excited and keen to see. Uh, I think one is, is the, uh, the continued progression of technology and um, being able to both conduct and monitor trials um, remotely and uh, the use of technology such as you know um, constant blood monitoring technology or um, access to hospital electronic notes remotely so that a lot of this um, CRA work can be done on a remote basis which means it can be done more frequently than, than being physically on site. There'll always be a need to be on site, there's certain things and again takes me back to the, the relationship aspect. You need to speak to people to sometimes identify what's going on at a site. But I think having that technology just means, from various perspectives, from a data integrity and also from a safety perspective, it just means you have that real-time ongoing monitoring of, of, of a study patient, which is, um, I think, going to be so advantageous. Um, the second part, uh, the second thing that I would really love to see is an increase in awareness and education of the clinical trials process. I think, you know, despite studying biology at, at school and university, I, I don't think at any point it was mentioned how you know drugs go from or devices go from conception and the process they go through to, to becoming approved on the market. Uh, I think one of the problems with that is is we're not getting perhaps the the staff coming through because if people aren't aware of this as a career progression, then they're not going to follow that. So I'd love to see in schools uh, an awareness and a, and a teaching of, of of that process of of how new drugs and, and devices are developed. And I think given the current um, era of, of misinformation and, and the resultant uh, almost mistrust of, of, of you know the trials process. Um, I think it'd be so beneficial to teach people how it works and also about sources. You know where to get your information from. You know such as peer reviewed, you know multi-source scientific journals versus you know the the opinion pieces that we're often finding now on on the internet and social media. Um, and I think we can't begrudge people for having those opinions if we're not educating people on how to do their own research. So again, I, I think the education and, and that side of things, I, I'd love to see uh, become more mainstream over the next next 10 years. Yeah, I love this idea. It's a great suggestion. Uh, and I, I agree with you. I didn't know anything about the clinical trial industry before I joined it. So yeah, I hope we see that too. Right, well, Tom, it's been lovely having you here. Uh, I really, really enjoyed having someone join me in person. It's been uh, a different experience. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well as I did. I've definitely learned a lot more today on the CRA role. Um, so come soon at the Kalis Cafe. We'll have another episode soon out. Uh, and Tom, thank you for joining me and I uh, hope you have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much for having me.